Welcome back. You're still watching the Breakfast on Plus TV Africa and now to our first major conversation on the program uh, this morning. Russia has begun a large-scale military attack on Ukraine. It's a southern neighbor on the orders of Russian President Vladimir Putin. Uh, there are reports of attacks on Ukrainian military infrastructure across the country and Russian convoys entering Ukraine from all directions. Now, Mr. Putin, in a televised speech yesterday, announced a military, what he called a military operation in Ukraine's eastern Donbass region, a parts of which have been occupied and run by Russian-backed rebels since 2014. Putin said Russia was intervening as an act of self-defense. Russia did not want to occupy Ukraine, he said, but would not or would demilitarize and what he called denazify uh, the country. Now, loud explosions were heard in the capital, Kiev, as well as uh, Kramatorsk in the Donetsk region of eastern Ukraine. Blasts have also been heard in the southern port city of Odessa. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky said Russia had carried out missile strikes in Ukraine's on Ukraine's infrastructure and on border guards of of that country. Russia's defense ministry, meanwhile, has denied attacking Ukraine cities or Ukrainian cities, saying it was targeting military infrastructure, air defense, and air forces with high precision weapons. But Ukraine says tanks and troops have poured into its country at points along its eastern, southern, and northern borders. The United Nations Refugee Agency said an estimated 100,000 Ukrainians had fled their homes. Thousands were crossing into neighboring countries, including Romania, Moldova, Poland and Hungary. The United States and European Union have announced another raft of economic sanctions but stopped short of targeting Vladimir Putin himself. And now joining us uh, to take a look at this particular uh, issue and of course give us his analysis uh, of um, the subject matter we have a guest and he has uh, been with us on the program before I'm talking about none other um, Dr. Kach. I'm talking about none other than Dr. Kach, uh, who is an international affairs analyst. Dr. Kach, thank you very much for your time and apologies for the mix-up. Thank you for having me. Forgive us, please. Thank you very much. Um, um, what are your thoughts on, on what's been ha happening so far? Of course, um, in the build-up to this particular uh, operation, uh, Vladimir Putin had denied um, uh, any intention uh, to attack or enter or invade Ukraine. And last week you were here talking about this same issue um, with uh, Joe Biden giving the exact day uh, that Putin will attack Ukraine. Now it's happened. Your thoughts? Well, uh, nothing is surprising to everybody. Uh, the way uh, the West led Ukraine on the primrose path was seen, was predictable. It was very, very simple. If there was the uh, doctrine uh, that says don't allow somebody bring any weapon on your backyard, and the Americans correctly reacted to it called the, uh, the, the Monroe Protocol. And the Monroe Protocol simply said the U.S. should refuse missiles being, in this case, stationed in Cuba, right on the U.S. backyards. And that protocol was acceptable across the world. That don't let it be, so that you're not taken unawares. And that's exactly the reasons why Russia begged that now that the curtain has fallen and that Perestroika has brought an end to the former Soviet Union, they ask that for the sake of peace, let us also extend the Monroe Protocol so that you do not come over to the east and the NATO alliance agreed and everybody agreed but then we've seen five different waves of NATO expansion. You had Romania join, Poland join, Lithuania, Estonia and uh, and now suddenly you're talking about Ukraine and if you look at the history between Ukraine and Russia you will know that one could not have existed without the other. Don't forget, Ukraine itself, as it is today, is a boutique creation of Soviet leaders. Remember Nikita Khrushchev? He is actually a Russian, but Ukrainian-Russian, uh, who became Soviet leader, and it was him who gave up uh, Crimea, 
with a Sebastopol port to the Soviet Navy, and that became the biggest right there. And uh, so we expect this history is known to NATO, and they should have pushed Ukraine this far down the primrose path. I believe the West should take the blame for this crisis. Russia complained, they listened, but then some people got cocky, and what we have now is a Russian reaction, which is strategic in terms of security considerations. It is strategic. That was why I asked uh, last week, I said, all this making noise right now, what have they done in regard to the Minsk protocol? What did they do since the crisis started in February 2014? What did you do as the crisis raged on, on the Donbass part? Don't forget, Donbass is the historical name uh, known of, for that area during the Middle Ages. And that's when all that was part and parcel of Russia. And through the creation now, several parts of Russia have been ceded to Ukraine. So I don't think it would be proper that the Russians should lose all that suddenly for an American seeking to peel away Ukraine from Russian wall and then use that as a bulwark on the Russian border. I think that's uh, what the Russians uh, are going uh, against. Uh, so Dr. Dr. we Kutch. need to be mindful about this. Yeah, yeah. this narrative that you you are you are you know you are putting out there is the same narrative that um, uh, the the Russian president is also putting out there. I mean, as we speak, uh, all you know, contrary uh, or independent media um, into Russia has been blocked. Uh, internet information getting into Russia has been blocked. And what the Russian president is telling his people, the information he's feeding them, or the propaganda, is that Russia is, is invading Ukraine as an act of self-defense. Now, you've talked about the port of Sevastopol. You've talked about the Minsk protocol, the Minsk agreement. Uh, you've talked about Parastroika. You've talked about, you know, um, every other thing, um, you know, uh, that Russia has, you know, against the 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 NATO getting into uh, bring Ukraine into its fold, but isn't this nation of Ukraine an independent nation that is a democratic nation that deserves the right to determine which groups it wants to join? Um, when Ukraine became independent, you're aware that some of the uh, conditions included, you know, giving up its its nuclear arsenal, if I'm correct. So where lies the 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 the, the, the the case for independence of Ukraine as a sovereign nation, because the Soviet Union is gone. Well, this is an argument you are making. I am happy I stated this, I stated this right before this crisis occurred. I stated this because I've been following the Minsk protocol. I have been following the events right from 2014, and I believe we could have avoided this particular crisis. Uh, Ukraine, yes, you now call it an independent nation, but then Ukraine to modern Russia is still the boutique creation that Russia created. And uh, there are things we should just be for us to have peace. Yes, you can call it an independent nation, but is Ukraine really independent? If Ukraine was independent, what did the West do when Crimea was taken by Russia. Can't you see that? You allow them to take Crimea. You allow them to sustain their stay at Sevastopol. And you then saw the crisis in Donbass. What did you do? Did Europe do more to try to bring about peace in Donbass? No. So this is what we're doing. And Russia now felt there's a need to protect those who came to be Russia, pro-Russia, and they are Russian speaking. And this is the problem. Yes, the Soviet Union may have broken down, but then you need people who understand history to guide the foreign policy players to understand that there are certain things that are not as the same. And as you've seen, Ukraine, it seemed an independent nation. But now, in actions, it's not independent. So, these are some of the intricacies that we need to learn how to manage. We saw it coming, and we begged. 
Don't move the spots. You're going to damage it. What Russia is doing, don't forget, it is reacting. So you could put all kinds of sanctions you want, but Russia is simply reacting to what it feels is a strategic security need. They now need to prevent Ukraine from being used as a staging ground. And I believe experience in Afghanistan and in Iraq, Russia may not want to occupy Ukraine. No, because you've seen in Russia and Afghanistan that occupation does not work because you end up fighting insurgency until you leave. So probably what I suspect they want to do is if Ukraine cannot stay stable and be peaceful, Russia will wreck Ukraine. And it is currently wrecking Ukraine from within. And after wrecking Ukraine, nobody in NATO would be fit or consider any remnant of what's there as uh, good enough to do any business with. That's what Russia is going to do. And I think this is avoidable. We so, should have stopped being this far. So, Dr. Katch, Dr. Katch and Nunu Drew. Yes. I, so are you saying that the Russia invading Ukraine is just to render Ukraine useless and not attractive to NATO? That's what it says. It is not invading to occupy, no. It is invading to wreck Ukraine. When you wreck Ukraine, NATO will not see anybody to deal with. And then if it's simply a geography stream with a lot of uncontrollable debris, there is none you can talk about. So that's like what they are doing, because from what we knew, the experience in Afghanistan and in Iraq have shown both Russia and the United States that occupation is old school. Occupation doesn't work anymore. If you do an occupation, you will end up wasting your energy, wasting your resources against the insurgency. So the right thing to do, as I think they are doing it right now, is going into Ukraine to wreck Ukraine. And then the West will see nobody to talk to after Romania, after Poland, and whoever is there. As for Belarus, Belarus is already with Russia. This also tells you what Georgia tried to do, see where Georgia ended up. What Chechenia tried to do, see where they ended up. This is why Zelensky should have learned that those who came before him have been politely navigating that very delicate balance of trying to situate Ru uh, 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 modern Russia and still be friendly to those mi who are in mi Europe. Mr. 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 Nuruju, Dr. Nuruju, um, so, so uh, there are some issues I have with, with what you're saying. Um, uh, but before I go, I, I respond. You, you're, you're, you're basically saying, from what you're saying, it seems like um, uh, Vladimir Putin still has this, this um, ideal, this obsessive fantasy uh, of... of, of the Soviet Union still being around because the Soviet Union no. died. It, it was gone. Because if you, you're talking about Georgia, you're talking about Belarus, you're talking about um, uh, 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 Ukraine, you know, and, and all these other countries that were part of the old Soviet Union. And as a particular country, I'm trying to remember right now whose president is also going after its citizens who are expressing, expressing support for Ukraine. Um, uh, uh, but Belarus being a client state to, uh, to, to Russia, and uh, even the troops from Russia using that as an as angle to, to attack Ukraine. This seems to be uh, um, a denial and a refusal to accept that there is no more a Soviet Union and trying to to have a semblance of, of the Soviet Union or trying to have that same influence over those countries that are independent. And I state again that Ukraine is independent. But you're saying that Ukraine is not independent because of Mother Russia. They are a sovereign nation or a sovereign nation with a sovereign constitution, a sovereign people, a sovereign flag, a sovereign army. They are not part of Russia. Um, so, 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 I mean, how can you then defend it? And it seems you're saying blaming the West and blaming Ukraine for Russia taking this action. Like the EU uh, uh, um, um, chair said yesterday, she said that Russia is the one attacking Ukraine. The West didn't attract, attack Ukraine. The West even tried no. to, they, they, they tried to have um, a sort of a, a peaceful resolution of the crisis with the likes of, of the French president, Macron, going to see Putin, talking to him. But Putin lied all along. He said he wasn't interested in attacking Ukraine. He lied and woke up one day and sent his troops into Ukraine. Now people, innocent people, are dying. And there's, a, there's an implication in the global economy. He didn't choose the path of peace. So this is all on him, Dr. Donuju. No, 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 no. You know, Cuba was also an independent nation. 
and Cuba had every right to you know, accommodate whoever it, it sought in his country. But the U.S. was very hysterical about the Soviet Union stationing missiles in Cuba. So if, due to the Monroe Doctrine, the West was not comfortable with the Soviet Union having such an advantage on sighting weapons to a place that is already the U.S. backyard, you don't do that. So that's also the same way that Russia felt about uh, Ukraine being used as a Western bulwark on the Russian border. So those who try to peel off Ukraine of modern Russia should have themselves to blame. You know, this is international diplomacy. You also need to look at the strategic import of defense and security considerations. Do Dr. Nuju, and, Dr. Nuju you, are, you, are, you are still making the point that this that was in the Soviet era, the, the, the era of the Cold War, when you had the standoff in Cuba between uh, the Americans and the Soviet forces. That was years ago. Like the EU is saying, Russia has taken us back to the dark ages that we thought Europe was out of. The world has moved on from that kind of, of thinking. And, of course, if, if, if Putin is still doing this, it means he still has this fantasy of the Cold War or the, the, the Soviet Union still being the Soviet Union. The world has moved on from that. No. So he's taking us back to where Let's, we don't want to go to. No. The Soviet Union is gone. So you're not going to have another Cold War. Russia is not the Soviet Union. But Russia needs security guarantees. And those security guarantees include a behavior like this by President Putin. Don't forget, Putin is not a normal politician. Putin came from the security branch of the Soviet state. He came from the KGB. So they are, first and foremost, thinking about protecting the integrity of the Russian state. It is the protection of Russia that Putin is acting on behalf of. We saw this crisis. Look, there is nothing that stops you from simply avoiding us getting there. When you knew if you push too much towards the Russian border, Russia will react this way. Russia would not wait for you to say you're shooting. No, it's just the same way the West saw Russia moving arms, soldiers, personnel, artillery to the Ukrainian border. And they were able to tell you that with an army this massively stationed on the border, the next thing is an invasion. That's okay, so Dr. Katch, uh, Dr. Yes. Katch, let's also look at the issue of the sanctions. I mean, if you, uh, you know, some people would say it's laughable that uh, the West would always, um, you know, chunk out this uh, uh, sanctions, but it hasn't really worked. It hasn't deterred Putin. It hasn't also deterred, you know, the likes of Kim Jong Un. And we've also seen, you know, back, you know, in Africa here where we had uh, the coups, especially, you know, in the West African region. And you see that uh, the ECOWAS, the communities would always place sanctions. And these sanctions don't really, really stop anything. Isn't it laughable that we constantly have to use sanctions as a way of trying to solve international problems? And that hasn't necessarily solved of any problem. Dr. Kach, what are your thoughts on this? Well, sanctions are old systems of reacting. Uh, sanctions simply will not work because uh, the person you need for sanction to work is China. And in this case, China, as I yesterday, was also reported to have breached the Taiwan security zone. So it also has territorial issues of its own. Even though I will tell you what Russia did in Ukraine is not about territory, it's about security. The biggest problem the West has is China. So China's gains and pretensions on the islands, in the sea, is a big problem. So the West does need Russia to go against China, to resolve Iran, to resolve Syria, and they resolve a lot of things across the world. The real adversary the West has is China. So China knows this, and China will make sure it does not allow those sanctions to work. What sanction? Is it sanction on the gas pipeline with the Nord Stream 1 and 2, when already China is also a, a competitor for that gas? China has put some of this gas into the future and buying a lot of energy uh, staples from Russia into the future. 
What that tells you is for Russia's energy market, there is competition from Europeans through the Nord Stream pipeline, and there is also direct competition from Russia, who also needs the energy to power its aggressive production capabilities for the rest of the world. China today is the production factory for the world, and they will need the energy going forward. So I really believe we have so much problems in the world that this Ukraine, something should have been avoided, should have been avoided by not leading Ukraine down the primrose path. Now that mistake has happened, and Russia has accordingly, predictably reacted the way we want. You know, it's not everything that you see that are actually the way they seem. Ukraine may seem like an independent country, but you have not seen through actions first in 2014 in Crimea, and then the crisis that gave birth to all this and to the separatist movements in Donbass, and Russia now using that as a pretext to ask its soldiers to go into Donbass for the sake of peacekeeping. And then from there, they now launch attacks going everywhere from Odessa to Kiev. Mm. Now, Dr. Katch. Where, where can't we, couldn't we have stopped this if we could? So, so Dr. Katch, if you're saying that, you know, sanctions are just old methods of solving problem, how do we go about? Because, I mean, this is an issue of human rights violation and not respecting, you know, the sovereignty of a nation. So how do nations, how do you, this bodies now solve uh, all of these issues? Not also leaving Africa out of this. And the second question would be, in all of this is going on, we have seen conversations in the spaces and some people say it's no business of Africa. Where does Africa stand in all of this? Well, Africa stands nowhere. Africa will simply <laughs> stay on its own. It has nothing it can do. It cannot rock the boat. It's not needed for sanctions. For sanctions, China is who is needed to cooperate or to bust it. And that I know they will bust it. Uh, Africa has nothing to do, but Africa also has something to gain because should Europe be looking for a competing platform to gain energy supplies, it can take Nigeria's ga uh, gas that has now been found to be the largest gas field in the whole of Africa. So there could be a long-term competition for the Russian Nord Stream gas that seems to be what the Germans and other Europeans are actually embracing for their energy needs. If they seek to change that, Africa is available to provide the alternative gas pipeline. But then, apart from that, there's nothing we can do because there are three players in this business. One is Russia. Secondly, is the United States leading the NATO alliance. The unseen player is China. China is very interested because of its crisis in the islands, in the sea, with bordering with its neighbors. It also has territorial issues in regards to its argument with Taiwan. So China right now is very likely to support uh, Russia. And of course, you know, Ukraine is not as a real estate of strategic interest to the NATO alliance, no. But Ukraine, as a real estate, is of very strategic interest to Russia. Secondly, Ukraine does not enjoy the triggering of Article 5 of the NATO Street. No. America enjoyed triggering Article 5 of the NATO Treaty because it said it was attacked by a foreign body in 9-11. And that was why, in reaction, NATO had now to come and back him. And that was how Article 5 came in. But in the issue of Ukraine, you cannot bring in Article 5. Ukraine is not a member of NATO. Ukraine should not have gone the path it did. Now it has done it. Look at the strategic calculations. Okay, Nobody okay. can save them. Dr. Nodu, you're, you're, you're still blaming, you're still blaming uh, an independent sovereign nation called Ukraine of um, even thinking, yes. thinking about about uh, uh, making its own you know, independent decision of joining the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And you're not condemning 
uh, uh, Vladimir Putin for, first of all, starting a proxy war in, in, in uh, uh, Donbass and in, in, in Crimea, and then going there saying he's uh, 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 he going to protect the Russian-speaking populace there. Meanwhile, you don't have only Russian-speaking people there. You have native Ukrainians there as well who've had to flee. Um, and then from there, now lying to the world and launching an attack on Ukraine, which has led to the lo loss of several hundred lives. You're not condemning Putin. You're simply saying for the fact that Ukraine even thought about joining NATO, um, that's their fault. And it's the fault of the NATO countries as well. But some will say that you, Vladimir Putin needs to be condemned in no uncertain terms and in very strong terms for this action. So why are you not condemning Vladimir Putin? Because I understood the fundamentals. You are only seeing the crisis. But I've been with this issue since 2014. I have followed this crisis since 1992. So, yes, you're talking about the end of the Soviet Union. Now we are dealing with the aftermath. And you say the end simply means everybody is free. Is Georgia free? No. Is Chechnya free? No. Belarus that allowed the joint military maneuver does that look like a free country? So, 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 therefore, no. so therefore, therefore, this this lends credence to the argument that Putin is refusing to accept that the Soviet Union is over. Ukraine, sir, you would agree, has consistently received or been been um, subject to interruptions and interferences in its politics by Russia all over the years. Is it about the gas pipelines? You know, being turned off all through the years. Russia has refused to accept that Ukraine is an independent nation. Is it their fault to try to exercise their freedom, to try to break away, to try to seek protection under NATO so that they can remain independent, free, and peaceful? Well, if you have a divorce between a man and a woman, and there are children involved in that, and the children are going to school, and the children are with, living with their mother, uh, you will be foolish to just jump into a relationship with that woman, with her children, and the crisis she has with her husband, you should just stay away and allow them to resolve their issues before you jump in. If you jump in anyhow, a fight meant for the woman could get you tearing your shirt. Tearing, no, you don't need to step in. It's a family matter. It has just started. It probably will take long. Don't forget, Ukraine and Russia have been on since the ninth century. The ninth century. That was before... Uh, China invented tea in the 10th century. <laughs> so <laughs> Ukraine and Russia have been together since before the introduction of tea, which we drink across the world. So if they have been that long and all the Russian campaigns happened on Ukrainian soil, Brezhnev is from Ukraine, Peter Khrushchev is from Ukraine. Ukraine is not just a normal country. It is a boutique creation of Russia. So when these things are, you know, unraveling, you don't just jump into it. No. You let it cool down. And that's why you didn't need to jump in. Now you've jumped into Ukraine. Yeah. Look at where we are. So, Mr. Ruju, you, 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 you refuse to, to you refuse to condemn Putin. That's okay. You won't do that till we are done. I'm sure even if we put a gun to your head, you know, you won't do that. But 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 um, they, they, they said power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Um, uh, with, with with Putin, uh, you said a former KGB spy who, in my opinion, has refused to accept that the era of the Soviet Union is over and has this uh, ambition to restore uh, the Russian glory that was lost with uh, the, 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 loss, the loss of the Soviet Union. If, uh, if he is able to do what he wants to do, he says he wants to denazify uh, uh, Ukraine. What does that mean? He says he wants to demilitarize Ukraine and then denazify Ukraine. What does he mean by denazify Ukraine? Well, he's playing with the rhetoric. And among the rhetorics, only one of them is real. Demilitarize. Demilitarize is exactly what that's why I'm telling you that he's not going to occupy. He will go there and make Ukraine an impotent. Don't forget, after the end of the Soviet Union, all the weapons that were in Ukrainian possession, especially the nuclear warheads, were all secluded into Russian hands. And so Ukraine is just a uh, so what you are saying is, right from the end of the Soviet Union, there have been this slow process of, of making Ukraine what it was in the days of the Soviet Union. They started that by taking away the nuclear uh, capabilities Ukraine has. Now, 
Russia took away Crimea, the Sebastopol port. Now, they, they started in Donbass, which is today's uh, uh, Donetsk and, and uh, Luhansk. But historically, in Primedia time, it was called the Primedia time Donbass. So now we're beginning to see Ukraine go back to its history. Why jump into that problem? No, I don't want to start apportioning blames because I believe I will be right every day to blame the man who left his house and went to a madman and started pointing fingers at the madman's face. The madman will break your head. When you ask me what happened, I will say you are foolish to go to his house to start poking at his face. A madman will react in a certain way. Russia, hysterical Russia, will react in this way. Russia is afraid that it okay. has been encircled. That's why it's doing what it's doing. Do that is what it is. So this is an act in my calculation of self-defense. Dr. Katch, uh, some other persons have also said that uh, Putin was affected by what happened to Gaddafi at the time, and uh, which was being led by NATO. And so this, he is looking at uh, uh, Ukraine as a 2.0 for Libya, apparently. And he's trying to, you know, probably maybe just protect himself. And that's the position that you're coming from. But we quickly have to, you know, uh, call for No, 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 no. You are, you, are, you are very, very wrong. Libya and Russia are not the same. Libya is not a nuclear. But but uh, but you but you can't take Russia away the fact that but, but you can't take away the fact that what happened to uh, Gaddafi was led by NATO. No, but it can never happen to Libya. It happened to Gaddafi because Gaddafi had no nuclear arsenal. If Gaddafi had had nuclear capability, NATO would not go to uh, uh, NATO would not go to Libya. So because Russia is a big boy, nobody's thinking of going there. Iraq. Kuwait was not a member of NATO, yet they went there to fight. So ask yourself, why wouldn't they go to Russia? Because so, Russia is a nuclear bearing power. All right. That's all. But in all of this, just as we you know, call for a tip to roll now, uh, we can't take out the fact from your analysis that Putin is just acting in self-interest. He's trying to protect himself and protect Russia. That's what it is. Yes, he is protecting Russia. It is not Putin protecting him. He has nothing to do. But if he protects he Russia, protecting he's Russia. part of Russia, so he's protecting himself. He is no, no, no. He's protecting Russia. All right. First then. and foremost, not working as a Putin. He's working as a KGB man. KGB security. Russian security personnel are protecting Russia's strategic security interests, and that is don't allow Ukraine to be used as a bulwark of Western defense against Russia. No, remove it. If they want to organize, let them go as far as Romania. Let them go as far as Poland. And then Poland will know that they will be beneficiaries of Russia's initial reaction should they feel threatened from Poland or from Romania. So you take the risk. You don't come and say Russia versus Russia. Because Ukraine is Russia, and Russia is Ukraine. All right, and uh, no, no, to, we, we, sorry to, to, to interrupt, sir. Yes, yeah, sorry to interrupt, sir. We, we would have to uh, take uh, a break. I wish we had somebody who, uh, who was a different school uh, to you to, to to be with you on this program so that uh, uh, we can, you can debate. You cannot hide yeah. you but, 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 change but, but we, we'll go on a break. Um, uh, we'll come back. Um, we have um, uh, an interview with a Nigerian, a uh, young Nigerian, um, who is in the... Uh, the city of Kharkiv in, in Ukraine, and he spoke to Plus TV Africa on his experience in Ukraine as we speak. Seven Faleti, a Nigerian medical student who has been in Ukraine since 2017. Earlier when I was speaking to Stephen, he told me that he was underground. Stephen, are you with me there? Yes, I'm here. I can see that... There's no light where you are. Can you tell us what's been happening and how safe you are? Uh, yeah, we were, uh, this morning when I was in my room, I was uh, studying for the class, and then I know that this sudden blast, I thought we were just fireworks, and then uh, later on I checked, it was continuous, and then uh, it was actually a blast from the Russian, I don't know if it's from the Russian or any of the uh, army. 
then that is when the state of the rest of the and then everyone really started panicking, everyone started moving. And in the only time that room, there was another room, and then uh, we were asked to move underground, and they found the metro in the underground where they are also asked to be in the safety area. So can you tell us how you moved from your from your home, your hostel, to where you are now, and where exactly is it? What kind of security has been put in place for you and others who are there right now? Uh, yes, uh, the Ukrainian government, I think, uh, they ordered us to go inside the metro for safety. The metro stop is an underground where the train passes, so it's safe, and then it's very deep. So in case of any blast or anything. So now, I think in this, I'm on the street now, so everywhere is, there's a black house. The street lights are up, as you can see, just the building is there. Yes, we can see that. There's a blackout. Yeah. Has, has this always been the case, or is this because of what's yeah. happening right now? Yeah, I think it's because of what's happening right now. And is government saying anything about the blackout? Is, is it a strategy? Uh, I have no idea. Is government saying anything about it? Have you heard anything? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I say things about it. I've been checking our Twitter for news and the news blogs. We've been saying something. But I'm not sure if it's concrete or not. How long more do you think you'd be underground there? Uh, not sure, probably to tomorrow morning. What are the kind of uh, things provided to keep all of you safe and healthy? Well, everyone is there. I think a lot of people went to the supermarket and they had to get food and everything of the shops. Because all the shops are now filled, so we all have our food and our backpacks inside the metro. You told me earlier that you're a medical student and you've been in Ukraine since 2017. Has there been anything like what you're seeing today? And are you willing to return home uh, now that the Nigerian government is saying that Nigerians in Ukraine would be evacuated? There's been nothing like this since I go here. I think everything has always been peaceful. I think until last yeah, when we are hearing rumors of war and everything. I forgot when last year, but later nothing happened actually. Then now it's just surprising. And then we've been hearing rumors. I think the US went us against innovation and everything, but we, we were like, we, had, we thought it was just a propaganda and uh, this year. And now it feels very. All right, like I said, the Nigerian government is planning to evacuate Nigerians from the troubled region. Would you be willing to return, or you think that things would get back to normal and then you would rather stay? Well, for now, I don't, I don't think it's safe to fly in now because the, uh, the blast in airports, actually, the major airports, there is still in Kiev and the one at Ivano. So I don't think it's safe to fly in now or fly out. Thank you so much, Stephen. We will get a, we'll keep in touch with you uh, during our flagship bulletin. That will be 9.30. You are one hour ahead of us. We'll keep in touch with you to know how it's going. I do um, say, please, remain safe where you are. And thank you. All right. Welcome back. Uh, uh, Dr. Donuji, if you're still there, um, that was... Um a Nigerian student in, in Kharkiv, Ukraine, speaking to Plus TV Africa on the news update earlier. Um, what are your thoughts on, on evacuation? Because, of course, the Nigerian embassy in Ukraine, in Kiev, has said uh, Nigerians there should be safe and should also be responsible for the personal safety. Uh, the Nigerian House of Reps yesterday during the plenary adopted a motion calling for uh, the federal government to evacuate Nigerians in Ukraine and even saying that they are ready to bear the cost personally. Um, uh, is eva evacuation possible at this point? Of course, evacuation is possible. Uh, all Russia is trying to do is just to knock out the response capability of the Ukrainian state. And in this way, it's going first for its military. So, demilitarization. Didn't stop vehicles moving on the streets. 
It didn't stop life, no. Everything can still go on, but they simply want to take possession of the important places like airports, military facilities. So they told you is that demilitarization. The other one of denazification is simply a mindset issue. They think they are like Nazis that hated Russians, they hated any of them. So that's why they put that word. But principally, what we're doing is to undermine and remove Ukraine's capability to own a military. The only force that can carry God uh, in the next uh, uh, fortnight there will probably be that controlled by Russia. And then they will leave it, come back home, set up a banana government that will look after the wrecked place and nobody can come and talk to them anymore. So I think that's where Russia is going to. Okay. So I do not yeah. support Russia. I'm not a Russian. I'm a Nigerian. I'm only uh, simply knowledgeable about these issues, and that's why I'm trying to explain what has happened and how we got here. Mm. And then also telling you there are things that could have been done to avoid this, because Russia is in a hysterical state. I'm very, very afraid that should they allow such gain to occur, that they're in trouble. The same way the Americans disagreed for the sighting of Russian missiles on American border, on the territory of an independent country, Cuba. It's the same way that Russia is currently reacting to any idea of NATO bringing armaments and weapons to be stationed on its border in a place called Ukraine, which historically, from the 9th century BC, has been a creation of Russian life. Okay, okay, but Dr. So Katrinunu Drew, um, let us also ask, you yeah. say that, that this is not a time, I mean, it's okay to go ahead with the evacuation plans, but uh, we also have a report saying that the Ukrainian airspace has been shot, and so it's uh, really dicey at a time to, uh, you know, want to, because apparently we're going to be using the airwaves, uh, the airways, you know, to get to evacuate a uh, Nigerian student there. Another issue of contention, it's been a lot of back and forth, especially looking at the micro-blogging platform, uh, that's Twitter. And some people say that Nigerian government should not be blamed for ev the evacuation, even though you can't take out the fact that they should be concerned about the, 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 the lives of her citizen in Ukraine and whether it's in Russia, because you have parents who have single-handedly sent their kids or words to school in Ukraine and in Russia, however the case may be? Well, you know, historically, uh, Nigerian government since the Buhari era is known for not being ready for anything. So I would be very surprised if uh, Nigeria uh, had been ready to do the right thing. Don't forget, this crisis was predictable. Uh, I said it on this TV station before the shootings occurred, and I told you, if the West don't do this, this will happen. And they did it, and it happened. So other countries knew about this inevitability. They were making amendments to pull their people away. Why did Nigeria not act at that time? It left it as ever about Nigeria. It starts to react. The Buhari administration is a government that does not uh, act. No, it reacts. But, so but Dr. Cash, you still have the Indians not... I mean, you also still have uh, Indians who are still in Ukraine. They haven't been evacuated. I'm not even sure the United States. It doesn't... Uh, I mean, Nigerians are not the only ones who have not evacuated her citizen. And uh, the other question you've answered this other part is how safe is the airspace at this point? The airspace is still safe. It's only there by Russia. The airspace is still being used. Uh, but of course, you have to agree with the people who control the entry and uh, the exit point. So once you and them, which right now are the Russian authorities, agree, of course, they will allow operations to continue. The Red Cross is also working. And I think uh, life is still moving on in Ukraine. All Russia wants to do is just stamp its authority on the entire space. Uh, just give it two, three days, we'll get clear pictures of where we're going to, and life will still continue. Right. So I really don't see a big issue mm. in this. It's not like you have a shooting war between Russia and Ukraine. No. You just have uh, Russia doing what 
a lot of people knew was going to happen. But when would this happen? It has not happened. So let us peacefully manage it in a way that doesn't take more lives that, that, than is necessary. All right, and Dr. Nuluju, yeah, be, be, before we go, because of time, sir, sorry to interrupt you, but, but um, um, how do you expect this to end? Um, because, of course, Russian President, um, uh, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Volinsky, Zelensky has been speaking today. He says that um, uh, Russia has attacked, you know, um, parts of Ukraine, including Kiev. Um, the BBC reports that um, the uh, 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 explosions around the capital city of, Kiev, of, um, Russia, of Ukraine. And Zelensky says he believes that uh, Russia is after him. They want to kill him. Now, you said Russia is just going out to demilitarize and, uh, um, um, you know, attack the military installations of Ukraine. Is this a get-in, get-out operation, or do you see Russia, you know, staying back a bit to impose uh, its authority and to sort of, in a way, indirectly annex you, the entire Ukraine by setting up a government there and deposing no, no, the no, administration no, no. of Russia Zelensky, possibly even killing Zelensky? No, no, no. Uh, Zelensky is not, is not necessary, not important. He has done what others refuse to do and that's why he's gotten the reaction that he got uh, that situation has been there since the crisis started but others were able to politely manage it you know but he came there and he showed how very uh, you know inexperienced he is and allowed nato to push him down the dangerous path so Zelensky is not the problem of russia russia will probably do a quick one and then install puppets and return back home. It has it has learned from Iraq and Afghanistan that occupation is old school. It doesn't work anymore. You saw how Russia suffered in occupation in Afghanistan. You saw how US suffered in occupation in Afghanistan. So soldier the armies learned from the mistakes of their own troops and also the mistakes of other nations. They know that occupation. Is old school nonsense. It doesn't work. Dr. What Katch. You do there is stop puppets, and that will be enough. Thank you so much. We do really appreciate your time. It's always a delight to listen to you, share your thoughts on this issue. And we look forward to uh, speaking with you as this event unfolds. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Katch. And Nuruju is the Director General at the Harry State Center, Abuja. Once again, thank you so much for your time. And that's the size of the conversation. And we have been making this comment, you know, on the side. That's a, that's a joke. We hope we don't get any missiles here. <laughs> oh, Mr. Well, well uh, you know, definitely won't. Uh, but but um, it, it'll be interesting to see how this pans out. Uh, we, have, we have so many questions for Dr. Noji, but uh, time is not a friend. Um, of course. Be sure of uh, around the clock coverage of the Ukrainian uh, Russian crisis right here on Plus TV Africa, around across the programs and across the news bulletins. You don't want to change the channel all through the weekend. And uh, till we return next week, my name is Kofi Patels. Well, if you miss out on any part of the conversation, it's all right to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, what Plus TV Africa. And do subscribe to our YouTube channel, it's at Plus TV Africa Lifestyle. I am Messi Boko. Have a fantastic Friday.